Coming up on Virginia Currents, hear stories of inspiration and resilience when we visit Korean War veteran and painter Howard Vaughn, along with his neighbor, a pianist and composer who doesn't let her disability slow her down, Samantha Ridley. Also, have you ever wanted to get to the roots of your roots? Find out how you can during my talk with the Virginia Genealogical Society. Plus, the down-home music performed abroad of the Hackensaw Boys, all next on Virginia Currents. All the way joyful and all the way sad. Welcome to Virginia Currents. I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed. Now, inspiration comes in a variety of forms, including in the people you see every day but haven't found the time to hear their stories. In an apartment building in Glen Allen, Samantha Ridley was so inspired by the courage, talent, and sense of humor of her neighbor, Howard Vaughn, that she asked our producer to tell his story. Now, that's when our producer realized Samantha had an inspiring story of her own to tell and decided to visit them both. Now, Howard's journey has been brushed by the Korean War, Warner Brothers helping people whose homes were devastated by natural disasters, and art. Samantha's journey also meandered around celebrities, nursing, caregiving, business, and playing music. Now, despite having serious health problems, her zest for living is uplifting. Here are their stories. I had been rolling down the hall and seeing Howard's work on the wall. And when I went into his apartment, I saw this amazing artwork. And I just got to thinking about how he really needed to tell his story. Somebody needed to see his artwork. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to call PBS. PBS, our friends are here. Good morning, Larry. Thank you. I am 84. I was born at Stop 3 Petersburg Pike. Stop three was where the street car used to stop and let people out, and then stop four, and etc. I was born 1933, April. I went to Montrose Elementary School. It's on Church Hill. I was a Hayan, there's no joke about that. This is my son, my daughter-in-law, and my two, two girls, one boy. And that's your son? Yeah. You gave okay. I think about eight, eight or nine medals. In 1950, that's North Korea invaded South Korea. Well, being Mr. Gung-Ho, and I said, well, I think I'll join. So I went, and I was in the Naval Reserve even at 17. I was leaving on a plane from Bird Airport to, uh, Cal to uh, California. I'd already gone through boot camp. I said, mother, if I get shot, I'll be in the back because I'll be running like hell. So <laughs> I'm always cutting up, but uh, they shipped me to uh, Young Dompa, First Marine. We were understaffed. That's why the First Marine Division came over with Chester Bow. And we just pushed from the small perimeter around Maison, uh, Pusan perimeter. Uh, Chester Bow and the rest of the generals in charge said, let's go around Incheon. So we went around the, the South Korea and went into Incheon and we landed in Incheon, which was invading. And I took a hit in the leg of shrapnel. Shrapnel, it was part of, a bomb. part of the bomb, and it splits. But the edges, when it splits, are like a razor. So when it hits you, it'll cut right through you. That's when we went all the way up, and then we kept pushing until we got into to, uh, North Korea. And then that's when the Chinese were getting nervous, I guess. So they came down. but. The Chinese had bodies. I mean, we're talking bodies, bodies. And the Chinese, I guess, figured we were going to invade them. So that's when they had a hordes of people. We were somewhat surrounded. And then that's when we decided to, well, they all, their slogan was, the Marines never retreat. So the general said, well, we're not retreating. We're just going to fight in a different direction. So we had to fight and head south. <laughs> I felt like it was about 20 below zero, but it's very cold over Korea. I used to get behind tank and try to warm my hands on exhaust or something, you know. We lost a lot of men, but we put them out. I think I remember loading the men, the, the wounded or dead, rather, 
into a pickup big trucks and brought them back. So it's uh, not a not a happy story. I'm glad I served as, as a Marine. I've always been a Marine. Uh, I have even my license plate is Marine Corps on it. So I'm very happy to have be one. Even, even though when I was in it, I wasn't happy at times. So. so anyway, that's about my experience. And then I, I became a combat artist at, at uh, Quantico. Well, I did the cover of magazines for Leatherneck Magazine. It's a magazine for, for Marines. In the olden days, in the 1700s, so put a leather bat neck around them so when they get in a fight, uh, a knife won't cut their throat. When I got out of the Marines, I got an offer at Warner Brothers, public relations. You have to be protective to, to the movie star. I had Jackie Giroux here. Uh, she started a two-bit movie called The Cross and the Switchblade. It was very nice. And Pat Priest was nice. The Monsters? Yes. Oh, yeah. She was in that. Jerry Lewis was a pain to you know what. I cut him off of a talk show, and he wouldn't talk to me. And that's when I wanted to learn how to paint, really paint. Welcome to my small studio. I was friends with Jack Woodson. Jack was a well-known artist. He did a lot of portraits. When I did a portrait of Nixon, that's when Jack said, you know, can you reach in and pat him on the back of the head, Howard? I said, no. He said, then you haven't got it. When you're painting, a canvas is flat. And you've got to be able to dimension, three-dimensional, reach in and pat him on the back of the head. The little picture of the little boy, Amish boy, I can touch his brim because it sticks out to me. And that's how I studied. And when you look at portraits, you always see a a light side and a dark side, where the dark side is a light background, and a light side, a dark background. That's when you get depth. I've always studied under being a, a, a detail painter. Uh, the eyes are very important to me when I study as somebody, because uh, eyes will tell you a lot. So. You've got to understand that when you're looking at somebody, you've got to study their face. You take your finger and rub it. So there's a lot of rubbing. Rembrandt painted a lot with his finger. Most portrait painters, they normally would take a photograph set up with lights and all, and take photographs of the highlights one side or the other, and uh, study those and then do a rough sketches. Of, but people don't know that, that you only use the live model when you're ready to get the exact color combination, that kind of thing. The drawing's already done. You ever heard of Lamar? Yes. Uh, that's who I work for, I was the vice president. Isn't that like a billboard company? Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's, hard, it's a hard sell, but I was very good at it, so, because uh, I like to talk. <laughs> I know, you never know. It's a secret. <laughs> I went to Daytona and I took over as, as vice president general manager. I used to tell my salespeople, I said, when you come in to meet people, introduce yourself, there's a stone, a glass wall immediately goes in front. And you've got to chip that down. And the only way you're going to do that is to look at the person and try to look at something in the room where you are. If it's something that you have a golf ball or something, oh, I see you play golf. Don't even talk your job because you've got to get their interest first. I was with FEMA. I can do all ends again in what they call Plaquemine Parish, which is on the other side of Mississippi. The, the water backed up and uh, that flooded. Because gas, because see in New Orleans, they don't bury people in the ground, they bury them above the ground. The caskets were floating across the road. So it was sad. So we were in tents outside of a churchyard, because the church had already been flooded. So we were out there and trying to help them. My wife died in uh, 2004. She knew she had cancer and she wanted to come home to Richmond. I've been here ever since. How long were you married? 23 years, yeah. Good woman? Very good. 
Did she tell you not to be alone? Yeah, she did. We have a girlfriend now, right? Mm, oh yeah, she's in her 70s, and I'm of course in my 80s. I'm robbing a cradle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and does she appreciate your art? Oh yes, yeah, she wanted me to do, do, do that butterfly in there. Do you find it rewarding to paint? Yes, I do. That's why I hibernate probably more here than anywhere, and because I like to paint. You're not letting your age stop you from creating these beautiful works of art. No. What's your advice with art? Study. That simple. If I'm going to do a portrait of a dog, I want to know all about dogs. I pull up on my computer, portraits of dogs. Or I can buy a uh, book on dogs. Like I can take you in right now and there's a book on butterflies. And that's the only way you can do it is study what you're going to do before you do it. And do it. Thank you, and take care, guys. I enjoy being with you. Okay. Now, for the scotch and soda. That's what we have. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Welcome. Come on in. I grew up in California, Southern California. But I was born in Detroit, and my parents moved from Detroit to California. My mom was a pianist. My dad played the trumpet. My brother plays trumpet and sax. My sister plays sax and piano. So I played piano organ. We had a lot of rehearsals in the evenings, and practice was mandatory. And you learn how to write, you learn how to read, you learn how to compose music. understand that you played for some celebrities? I did. I was friends with Clifton Davis of Amen. I played for Clifton Davis, um, Bo Williams, and he was a part of that Star Search program, Little Richard. We went to the same church. I was a nanny for Randy Spelling, Tori Spelling's brother. This picture was actually on a CD that I was working on years ago. What did you do in California? You played professionally? I did, and if I wasn't doing that, I was modeling. I was um, working as a temporary nurse through the agencies. I did a lot of different stuff. It was always something to do. Yeah. Got daughters, you know, yeah, I was busy. I was actually 55 when I moved in here. Things started going downhill right away. I started falling. I noticed that my leg was starting to drag, so I'm looking at my foot and it started to turn severely, so I'm having trouble walking and I'm falling. I went to see the neurologist. He did an MRI and came back with conclusive evidence that I did have MS. I was horrified, I mean, I just, thought that I was going to be crippled, you know, be shunned. That didn't happen. You know, I, I thought, you know what? Okay, so I have MS. Let's find out what does it really mean to have MS. And I started researching it. It's a neurological disease. It affects a lot of functions. Like? My eyesight my ability to swallow properly, my ability to walk, balance or imbalance, pain, uh, weak immune system. How many days does a, a oh. relapse last? It can last a couple of months. Pain everywhere, I can't get out the bed. And holding onto the furniture so I don't fall. I, I just don't want people to see me like that. That's just humiliating to me. So I'd rather wait till I can look better, feel better, and have a happy face. How do you take care of yourself? You live alone? I do. I do. My determination. I, I just, by the grace of God, I just refuse to just like lay down and just say, oh, this is it, you know. felt like this is just too much, this can't be happening. I just got a hold of MS being my story, in my life. Now breast cancer, I didn't believe it when they told me that. They, you know, were all in amp mode. Oh, we have moved now, we gotta go get this taken care of. 
had the surgery set up 30 days after the diagnosis and then the radiation. I had been um, diagnosed with breast cancer and I was nine days out of the hospital when I did the first concert here, which was an absolute honor. So today, I'm now a one year breast cancer survivor. And how, how long ago was that? 2012. Okay, so you've hit the five years? I've hit five years. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I have uh, hardware in my left foot. I fixed the foot where it wasn't turning, so it's called foot fusion surgery. And the one thing he said, whatever you do, don't put any weight on that foot. And um, I was putting dishes away, and I felt the walker that I had my knee on so I couldn't put any weight on my left foot. It moved, and I could feel it. I'm like, oh my god, this is going to be bad. And I just hit the floor on the back of my head and just heard myself screaming and screaming. How were you on the floor? Oh. I saw daylight come and go twice, so I knew it had to be 20 hours. I drug myself from the kitchen to my bedroom and made the phone fall on the floor so I could get help. And the doctor said, you have broken your back. I mean, those words were just resounding to hear somebody say, you broke your back. What does Miss Music give you? Oh. Peace. Peace and tranquility. Is it like therapy? It is. Um, right now, I'm, I'm playing when I'm able to at my current church. Do you enjoy it? I love it. I love it. I really do. I love that it makes people happy. That's, that's a good feeling, making people happy. This is actually my artwork, which I kind of threw up there. What, what do you mean you? your artwork? Did you paint this? Yes. What? All right, show that. What's the um, purpose of the butterfly? You will never find the same butterfly. I don't care if you had a million flying by you at the same time. They'd all be different. So I like the uniqueness of them. And they're happy. They're beautiful. They're light. They just fly away. You've never in your life heard of a butterfly attack. So I just think it's great. I didn't want to say, well, why is this happening to me? You know, I didn't want to do that. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get through this. Don't know how, but I am. A lot of people would want to just shut down. I don't know how to do that. I really don't know how to do that. There's always tomorrow, a better day, you know. I think I have something to do. I'm telling my story. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the story will help. That's what I really hope for. Somebody, you know, feels better, encouraged, uplifted. Samantha tried medications for her MS symptoms, but said she suffered too many side effects. So she drinks a special juice that includes the spice turmeric, which has anti-inflammatory benefits. To hear her music, visit the website on your screen, which is a website dedicated to musicians with disabilities. And to reach out to Howard, his email is on the screen as well. She was so beautiful. I only met my grandmother once, and then she died. But I started chasing who she was, and she's full-blooded Cherokee Indian, so that was a real important thing to me. But I don't have a lot of information, just where she lived, how old she was when she died, and who she was as her nationality. Welcome to Daphne's Corner. Have you ever wondered about your roots? Who came before you, where they lived? Were they farmers, business owners, or even royalty? To help people get started on tracing their ancestry is the Virginia Genealogical Society. And we're joined now by Mary O'Brien Vidlack, a certified genealogist and president of VGS. Welcome, Mary. Hi. What is the Genealogical Society and uh, how can we access them? The Virginia Genealogical Society is our state society. We were basically formed in 1960 
to educate people, help them find their families. There's a lot of focus, as you would expect, on Virginia, but there's also focus on a more general, how do you get involved with genealogy and what do you do with it? Why is it important to know your roots? I think it is because it, some people do it for particular reasons, like they're looking for their medical history. But basically, when we do genealogy, we're learning who we are. What, is the, what are the values that we have? Why did our ancestors come to where they are? Mm -hmm. um, what did they believe in? And that helps us to know more about how we make the decisions that we make. So how do you start? You always start with yourself. Uh -huh. So you need to get all the information about yourself and you don't overlook that step. And then you work with your parents and your grandparents and you keep moving back in time that way. You also want to get information on your siblings, your parents' siblings, your grandparents' siblings, and keep moving back incrementally okay. in genealogy. No, that's verbal as well as records that you have in, in the family? Yes, you want to talk to everybody that mm -hmm. you can, particularly people who have memories that you don't have, mm -hmm. but you always need to write everything down because otherwise that's lost um, if it's not recorded. And then what do I do? Where do I get further records? Uh, if you're in Virginia and you're looking for people in Virginia, uh, Virginia starts collecting vital records, so sort of the skeleton of a person. They start collecting birth and death records in 1853. They collect them to about 1896, and then legislation changes, and they don't collect them anymore until 1912. So you've got a big gap there. Marriage records also begin in 1853, although there are marriage records prior to then because marriage was a legal contract, so you've got a lot more paperwork connected with that. Okay, is this something that I have to go to a library to do, or can I do it online? Or You can do a lot of it online. A lot of Virginia Vital Records are on Ancestry, which is a commercial site. Mm -hmm. um, but Ancestry, if you don't have it and have it on your own computer at home, you can access it at most public libraries. You can access it at the Library of Virginia, so you can use that for free and look at that. For Virginia records also, if you're not finding what you're looking for on Ancestry, and you won't because everything is not online, right. you're going to have to actually go to the library. Library of Virginia is a phenomenal resource and they have all different county records there and state records. Well, I know that there were a lot of missing records in the African American community because they were treated as property rather than as people. How does one trace the African American roots in Virginia? African-American research is much more challenging um, when you're talking about enslaved people. So free blacks are counted just the same way that anyone else is, but when you're looking at enslaved people, they are not counted um, by name until emancipation. So 1870 is the first time you are going to see them with their names. Hmm. Prior to then, you're going to find them under the names of their owners. Ah, so. DNA tests, we hear a lot about DNA tests and sending them off in the mail. What's the value of those? DNA tests are one more tool in learning who you are, and they are a tremendously valuable tool because DNA doesn't lie. So people may have lied on paper records, DNA does not lie, but DNA cannot stand alone. So you don't do a DNA test and then find out who your ancestors were. Uh -huh. You still need to do that legwork and build that paper trail so that you know where you fit in and how you're related to people who share DNA with you. What can people really do to get to the root of where they're from? It's not something you find easily. Mm -hmm. You need to keep developing your skill set, so you need to attend conferences. And for example, VGS does two conferences a year. We're doing one at the end of April. We do, uh, and, and our April, our spring conference, conference is always in Richmond. Our other fall conference rotates. Our fall conference in 2018 is in Charlottesville. And those are opportunities for you to go and learn more about different record groups. Thank you for joining us. And if you want to find out more about these programs and other helpful resources, visit the website for the Virginia Genealogical Society at vgs.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daphne. This week's Spotlight on Virginia Music shines on the gritty music of the Hackensaw Boys. For 20 years, this band, based in Charlottesville, has attracted big crowds across the states and the European countryside. 
They play American Roots music with a working class mentality fueled by a rowdy punk spirit. Over 28 members have cycled through the group with founding member David Sickman still at the helm. In January, they released a reboot of Blaze Foley's 1980s song, Oval Room, which has political undertones they believe ring true today. Here now is a clip of Happy For Us in the Down, performed in the Netherlands. Thanks for watching Virginia Currents. Join us next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Daphne Maxwell-Reed. The wind on the side.